I saw when I walked out there. I got here before it started raining, but um, I'm glad to see you guys here. I have a few announcements. Um, so Wednesday, we don't have an adult study going on, but we do have um, youth groups, so Regenerate, and Kids Club at 630. So we'll still have those two things for teens and kids. And then um, Tony and Kylie Cole have invited us to the... <laughs> Sorry. Tony and Kylie Cole have invited us to... Uh, a pool party that they're having August 8th at the Linton Pool. It's from 7 to 9. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby. Um, just RSVP so they know how many people is coming. Because I think they have a limited amount of people that can go. So I don't remember what it is, but it's 100. So that might be hard to fill up, but it might not also be hard to fill up. So please RSVP. Um, and then our next men's group is the 13th of August at 6 o'clock. So um, we didn't have our last one due to a few different things like vacation going on this summer. So we, uh, we'll have the next one th that day. And then we have a new giving system. So if you are on the old giving system, make sure you switch over because it will be inactive in the next few weeks. Um, there's a new QR code that Matt has on the slide that's behind me, and it'll take you right there. Also, you can go to the website, and you can click on the giving page, and it will take you there as well. With all that, did you guys are ready? Okay. God, I just thank you for this morning. Thank you for allowing us to be here to um, worship you together. I pray that you would have your way in worship and in service. Amen. And here you go. I'm going to take your mic. Do what? I'll probably take your mic when I'm oh, okay. preparing for this. Check. Guys, this was working five minutes ago. I don't know what's up. We're just going to continue. Let's <laughs> all so stand up if you like. Worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to a God who heals, we sing to a God who saves, 
You seem to a God who always makes a way Cause he hung up on the cross Then he rose up from the grave My God still rolling stones away My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. 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 There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. you've done for me, and I will praise you all my days, not just for the things that you made in me, well, I will love you, Lord, always, not just for the things that you've done for me, and I will praise you all my days, not just for the change that you made me but i'll praise you for you are holy lord and i will lift my hands but you are worthy of so much more for you are awesome 
serve you Lord always you are my strength when I am weak and I will never be afraid for you are my rock and you protect me but I'll praise you for you are holy Lord and I will lift my hands for you so much more because you are awesome God of the nations I of Judah rock of the ages Alpha Omega worthy of all praise more than these hands are for you are awesome God of the nations light of Judah rock of the ages Alpha Omega, worthy of all praise, more than these hands I'll raise, so I'll live a life of praise, live a life of praise, yeah, I will love you, Lord, always, well, I will love you, Lord, always. I will love you, Lord, always. And I will love you, Lord, always. I will serve you. Yes, Jesus. Well, I will serve you, Lord, always. will serve you, Lord, always. I will love. I will love you, Lord, always. Not just for the things that you've done for me, but I will praise you all my days. Not just for the change that you made in me. And I will serve you, Lord, always. For you are my strength when I am weak. And I will never be afraid. For you are my rock and you protect me. But I'll praise you for you are holy, Lord. And I will lift my hands for you. So much more for you are awesome, God of the nations, light of Judah, rock of the ages, Alpha Omega, worthy of all praise. More than these hands, out for you are awesome, God of the nations, light of Judah, rock of the Alpha Omega, worthy of all praise, more than these hands I'll raise, to live a life of praise, live a life of praise. Yeah. I will love you, Lord, always. Yes, 
Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, precious Lord, none on the earth or heavens above that I have found more beautiful. You are my treasure, my great reward. I just want to move it's all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you, no matter how much the cost. I freely give it all to you, all to you. Jesus, Jesus, my my hope, my dream, and here's my life, Lord, a sacrifice, oh, just to bless you, I just want to move your heart, get caught within your gaze, or here in your presence, God. Is where I want to stay, just to dwell in your house, waste my hours and my days on you, all on you.
Jesus. Thank you. Your love is extravagant. Your friendship, it is intimate. I feel like moving. To the rhythm of your grace, your fragrance is intoxicating in a secret place. Cause your love is extravagant. We're spread wide in the arms of Christ. Turn my heart again. Cause your love is extravagant. Your friendship. Captured my heart again. You captured my heart again. You captured my heart Jesus 
I just thank you for being able to worship you this morning, God. I just I pray that you would help us to just seek you each and every single day, God, that you would just help us to seek the love of Jesus each and every single day. And I just pray that you'd have your way in this service um, and say what you want to say today, God, and help us to be open to it. In Jesus' name, amen. So I didn't announce this earlier, but Debbie is still on vacation. She's been having lots of fun. I know Matt's here today. Um, if you have any questions about any other trips, you can probably ask him, but don't bombard him, please. Um, I still get to work with him every single day. So, um, But with all that said, we have a guest speaker today. Debbie arranged this. Um, we have Susie Bradley. From the district office today, um, she helps. Cred well, she's over the credentialing, so she had a huge part of getting Debbie um, ordained. So, with all that said, here she is. <laughs> Thank you, Meg. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody this morning? First, let me say off the bat, I have a cold, so I apologize if I sound croaky or if I need to grab a drink of water um, in the middle um, to, uh, to uh, dry my, th for a dry throat or whatever. Um, um, but I am really honored to be here. I was so honored um, when Pastor Debbie called and texted actually and said, can you, can you come? Um, we were here, um, introduce my husband, Barry, he's right here, and our daughter, Jessica. Um, we have our son, um, Jeremy wasn't able to be with us um, this morning, but um, we are so thrilled to be here and I'm so honored. We, uh, Barry and I were here a few weeks ago. We went on your picnic. We went to your church after picnic and that was just because we love your pastor. Um, I consider Pastor Debbie one of my dear friends. Um, she and Pastor Matt are a blessing to us um, and we've enjoyed getting to know them. I um, met your pastor through Barry. Um, Barry and um, Pastor Debbie went through ISOM together, and he introduced me to her, and we kind of got acquainted, and then at district events or whatnot, we, we got more acquainted and realized that we were just meant to be buddies, <laughs> and um, she's just a blessing, and she'll text me encouragement in, in out of the blue if, if, if something, you know, she doesn't even know, I mean, I'll get an encouraging text or call, and she'll, she'll send me music videos, and um, just right when I need it, and I consider her a real blessing in my life, and I know that she's a blessing to you, and I know how much she loves you, and um, it is an honor to be here today. I'm going to put this over here for now so I don't knock it off, which is likely to happen if you know me very well. Speaking of know me ver knowing me very well, if you spend any time with me at all, you will learn two things about me, um, aside from that I love Jesus and I love my family, is that I love to read. I am always got a book. I have a book in the car because I was hoping to make, you know, I, I just always have a book with me. I'm always reading. But the second thing that you will learn very quickly about me is how much I love being in nature. I like hiking. We love camping. I love being outside. Um, I love being in trees and around growing things. Um, I've never been very good at growing things. If you look at the outside of my house, you'll see you would see that. I've gotten better at inside plants. Um, um, but I've just learned um, what peace comes of spending time in creation. Um, and the Bible repeatedly uses nature, especially plants and trees, um, and their seeds and their fruit, as a metaphor for our spiritual lives. Um, I mean, it's everywhere in the Bible. I could, use, I could list an entire page of scriptures um, and that use plants, especially trees, to illust illustrate spiritual growth, spiritual health, and spiritual reproduction. Um, there are trees in Genesis 2. 
the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And at the end, Revelation 22, there's a tree in Psalm 1 um, where we read that God wants us to be like a tree planted by streams of water. Jesus talks about the true vine in John chapter 15, Isaiah's stump that will shoot, uh, which a shoot will grow and bear fruit. We know that to be Jesus. Um, and then there's the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. And I can go on and on about it. Um, I could, really. I could bore you to death with it, but I won't. <laughs> um, but I encourage you to take a look for yourself, then go for a walk in the woods and see what God might say to you. Um, but that's a message for another time. Um, this morning, um, we're going to take a look um, at what is necessary to have a fruitful and productive Christian life. We're going to look at Luke chapter 8, verses 14 through 15, if you um, are familiar with um, the, the parables of Jesus, you're, this one's going to be quite familiar to you. And we're going to read it. I don't, it might be up there sooner, but it's, it's the, what you it would be in your Bible would be called the parable of the sower. When a great crowd was gathered and people were coming to Jesus from one city after another, he spoke to them in a parable. A farmer went out to scatter his seed, and as he was scattering it, some fell in the path where it was crushed, and the birds of the sky came and ate it. Other seed fell in the rock, and as it grew, it dried up and because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorny plants. The thorns grew with the plants and choked them. Still other seed landed on good soil. When it grew, it produced 100 times more grain than was scattered. And as he said this, he called out, everyone who has ears to hear should pay attention. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. And he said, you have been given the mysteries of God's kingdom, but these mysteries come to everyone else in parables so that when they see, they can't see. And when they hear, they don't understand. This parable means the seed is God's word. And the seed on the path are those who hear, but when the devil comes and steals the word from their hearts so that they won't believe and be saved. The seed on the rock are those who receive the word joyfully when they hear it, but they have no root. And they believe for a while, but they fall away when they are tempted. And as for the seed that fell among the thorny plants, these are the ones who, as they go about their lives, are choked by the concerns, riches, and pleasures of life, and their fruit never matures. The seed that fell on good soil are those who hear the word and commit themselves to do it with a good and upright heart. Through their resolve, they bear fruit. Father, I uh, ask that you would bless this reading of your word. I pray that you would bless the message that we'll bring forth, Lord. I, I pray, God, that we would all have ears to hear, me included, Lord, what your word would have us to say this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have scattered seed in our hearts, Lord, and let us hear what the Spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, verse 4 of our passage tells us that a lot of people came out, and Jesus was teaching them that day. And he, and he often taught about with parables. And a parable, as probably most of all of you know, is a simple story that illustrates a spiritual lesson with a truth in it. And he um, often used parables to communicate um, cultural symbols. He used cultural symbols when he t used parables. Um, that his hearers would understand, even though maybe they couldn't initially grasp the spiritual meaning, they could understand. They could understand the symbol that he was talking about. So, as we get into, before I start breaking down this passage, and maybe you've all heard messages about it before, but I'm going to probably maybe take a, maybe a way that you haven't heard, maybe you have. But I want to start by differentiating between dirt and soil. Um, dirt is made up of a mix of organic matter, although it is actually dead. Dirt is dead. It, it, it's matter that includes sand, clay, silt, rocks, pebbles, and more. However, it doesn't contain any of the minerals and nutrients or microorganisms that a garden would need or a field would need or an orchard would need or a forest would need or anything close to resembling what is necessary to have a live and working ecosystem. Dirt also doesn't have a structure, and that's due to the fact that it's dead and devoid of nutrients. It cannot support or nurture 
the growth of life. Soil, though, is alive. Where the dirt is dead and devoid of living eco a living ecosystem, healthy soil is full of living organisms that help plants thrive. Soil is created when mountain stones and bedrock are broken down by wind and rain over centuries with input from plants and animals and bacteria. In fact, soil is usually made up of multiple ecosystems of microorganisms and insects that create a food web that transfer nutrients one, from one to and fro. And, they, and soil absorbs carbon from the environment and detoxifies pollutants and recycles nutrients, all of things which help create and support a stable ecosystem. And you're like, well, why are, you, why are we going, why are we, <laughs> why are we talking about dirt and soil? Um, soil, because soil is the natural medium for growth. You cannot have successful, you cannot have successful growth, crops, gardens, forests, without good soil. You can't. It's, it, it is, it is, you, you can't. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it is symbolic of and comparable to our hearts, is what the, our scripture says today. Your Bible probably references this portion, as I mentioned, as the parable of the sower, you know, um, that were added by people later. Um, but the truth is um, that we know the sower is God, right? But he is the least significant part of this story. It assumes that God is out sowing seed. The sower went to sow his seed. Um, he's only mentioned once. The seed is not the focus either. The seed is the same throughout. Wherever the seed landed, it's the same seed. Whole and perfect in and of itself. The word of God is whole and perfect in and of itself. The only variable in this par parable is where it landed. And so this probably would be better called the parable of the soil. And so our scripture says in verse 5, it says, As he was scattering it, it fell on, some fell on a path where it was crushed, and the birds of the sky came and ate it. As the sower scattered his seed, some of it fell on the path, and the path was hard, and it was packed. It's crusty. It's plain old dirt. The seed can't penetrate the surface so it can't sprout down into the earth and take root. It sits on top to be trampled upon, to be crushed, or to be devoured. The Greek word for path here in Luke is the word hodos, and it means just what you think it means, a general term for a thoroughfare to get from one place to another. It's a place where the world moved. However, it can also take on a more metaphorical meaning and is the way or the manner of life. In other words, God word the seed landed in the way of life that is hard, that is trampled and devoid of life. It feels like that kind of right now when you turn on the TV and you, excuse me, and you, or you're checking the news feeds and you're looking around going, Life is hard. It's hard out there. And everything that might be life-giving is stepped on and squashed. And it feels like God's word cannot penetrate culture. I apologize. So what makes hearts impenetrable? to the word of God. What makes a hard heart? Well, let's start with the, the disciples. They couldn't understand the parable. They didn't understand the story because it was about the listeners. They came to Jesus to hear about the kingdom of God and what God was going to do for them, to heal them, to deliver them, to release them from oppression. They couldn't or they wouldn't grasp that Jesus was talking about them that they were being held responsible, that their capacity to grasp the truth, absorb the truth, cultivate the truth, and allow it to take root in their minds, hearts, souls, and spirits. They lived under the law, and their understanding was that their responsibility was to obey the law. That's all they thought they had to do, to do the works laid out for them by their spiritual leaders. They couldn't wrap their minds around the idea that good spiritual fruit grows from good spiritual soil, 
And, there, and right here, Jesus was teaching them that it is their responsibility to tend to the soil of their hearts. We are saved by grace alone, but it is our responsibility to be receiving and be receptive to what the word of God has for us. The world, and way too often Christians, choose not to listen. Sometimes we really don't want to hear, right? Parents, sorry. <laughs> Your parents, sometimes we don't want to listen. As an adult, I don't, you know, sometimes I don't want to hear something my husband wants to tell me. I don't want to hear it. And I think a lot, I know that there have been times in my life when God is speaking to me and I don't want to hear what he has to say because it's going to require something of me that I don't want to do or to change or to let go of or to surrender. There is a story in the Bible that illustrates exactly this point. And it's the story is not a parable, but and it's and it's found in three of the four gospels. But um, we'll look at the passage from Mark, and um, it, it's not on the screen. But it's Mark chapter ten, verses seventeen through twenty-two, and it goes like this: As he was setting out on a journey, this is Jesus. A man ran up, knelt before him, and asked him, "Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life?" Yes, we're talking about the rich young ruler here. Why do you call me good, Jesus said. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You know what to do. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud and honor your, honor your mother and father. And the man said, I have done all of these things. I have kept the law from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. He loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But he was dismayed by this demand, and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Verse 12 from our original text talks about this exactly. The seed on the path are those who hear and when the devil comes and steals the word from their hearts so they won't believe and be saved. The rich young man heard Jesus' words, but he wasn't listening. He even responded to them, but he wasn't listening. He didn't want to hear what Jesus was asking of him. He didn't want to respond. He didn't want to do it. This young man did all the things he thought he needed to do to be right with God. He thought he was doing enough. But with love, with love, Jesus confronted him and told him that it wasn't enough. And the man's desire to protect what he had made his heart hard to the seeds of truth Jesus was trying to sow in his life. Jesus' words could not penetrate this young man's heart. The enemy was able to steal the man's opportunity for a treasure in heaven and an abundant life with Jesus. And the man, young man walked away. And please note this. Jesus did not go after him. He let him go. Now, we don't know whatever happened to that young man, and maybe someday, I don't know if you're like me, sometimes Jesus' words have to marinate, they have to sit for a while, and Lord willing, hopefully, maybe someday, that, that seed did bear fruit, and he did hear, and he did turn around, and he did become a follower of Christ, but we don't get that in the story. All we know is Jesus did not run after him and go, please, here, let's talk about it, let's talk about it some more. No, he, made it, he let the man, young man live with the decision that he made. In order to grow and thrive, we have to be willing to identify the hard places within our hearts that are resisting God's word and his presence. He was there standing in front of Jesus, and he could resist. He resisted. 
How often have we stood in the presence, stood in this room, stood in someplace else and in another church and another place where God is speaking to you and we have resisted Jesus' words? What are we holding on to or willing, unwilling to relinquish and then therefore forfeiting spiritual treasures that God has stored up for us? Is God speaking to you about those areas and you're refusing to listen? Are you turning away from the voice of the Holy Spirit? But, and just remember, Jesus loves you, but he will let you live with your choice. So how do we listen? Like, how do we respond? What should we be doing? Well, we listen in prayer, obviously. We listen in the Bible reading when God is pouring out the seeds of life through the word of God. We, in, our, in our worship services, when we listen to trustworthy people who can speak into our lives, that we are willing to listen to what they hear, have to say to us, even though it might be a hard word. Is it difficult? Absolutely. But the spiritual growth, the treasure Jesus has for us is so much better. Don't live with a hard heart that won't receive the life Jesus has for you. The seed that fell on the hard ground. Then Jesus goes on and talks about that other seed fell on a rock, and as it grew, it dried because it had no moisture. All too often, we blame failed growth on the seed. We blame the word. (laughs) If the seed is the word of God, there's nothing wrong with the seed. Once again, we see Jesus reminding his listeners that the problem is with the soil. Our hearts. The problem is with our hearts. In our text, Jesus says that the plants began to grow, but they dried up because their roots couldn't access the moisture of the soil. He explains this to his disciples, saying that for some, they received the seed, but because the soil of their hearts was shallow, it prohibited the the root, the tap root, from digging down into the soil and thus grounding itself, rooting itself, establish itself in the ground. Because it, and there, if it, it couldn't establish itself in the ground, it couldn't absorb the moisture to grow. Shallow and superficial faith. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And I'm going to try to, to go through this story really quickly because there's another story in the scriptures that talk about this exactly, and it's from Mark chapter 11. And it's right before Jesus is trying... It's after Jesus' triumphal entry, but it's, it's coming up to Passion Week. And Jesus and the disciples are coming over from Bethany. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And he looked around at everything. Because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. So Jesus is, it's, it's Passover week. Jesus is coming in with the twelve. He just stops, and you could just see him looking at all the things that are going on in the temple. What's happening? They're buying and selling and all the things that are going on in the week of Passover. And he just, if he doesn't do anything, he just watches and then he leaves. And the next day, after leaving Bethany, they're going back to Jerusalem. Jesus was hungry, scripture says. And from far away, he noticed a fig tree in leaf. And so he went to see if he could find anything on it, because he was hungry. Figs, they eat figs. But when he came to it, he found nothing on it. There was no fruit. There was nothing but leaves. Since it wasn't the season for figs, and he said, and he cursed the fig tree. That's the parallel. Jesus went, I just want you to draw that parallel. Jesus went to the temple. He looked around saw what he saw, and left. The next day, he went to the tree. He saw what he saw. He thought it should have some fruit. It didn't have any fruit, so he cursed He cursed the fig tree. And then what did he do after that? He went to the temple, and he turned over the tables, and he said to the people, you have turned my, this would be a house of prayer for the nations, and you have turned it into a den of thieves and robbers because they were buying and selling in the house of God. And then early the next morning, as Jesus and his disciples were walking away, 
They saw the fig tree withered from its root up. Peter remembered this and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look how the fig tree you cursed has dried up. And I'm going to spend a couple minutes here to unpack these verses because our primary text in Luke, the parable of the, of the soil, Jesus is, Jesus is a master of making a point without making a point. <laughs> Um, he does not explicitly explain the connection between the cursing of the big tree and his actions in the temple. Um, but he's using trees and roots to make a spiritual principle and teach a spiritual lesson. The, the Bible says that on the day of his triumphal entry, Jesus went into the temple and looked around, and that's all he did. And we talked about that. Um, but I want to talk a minute about the fig tree. Um, if fig trees in this part of the world shed their leaves just before the winter in raising season and then new shoots sprout in March or April, signaling the coming of summer, the petals from its long flower become the fleshy, succulent, oblong fruit. In that climate, the tree produces fruit almost 10 months of the year. In March or April, the branches put forth new leaf buds and most of the early green figs, which are um, called the winter fruit or old untimely or late figs. Although they do not yet contain juice, they are eaten for lack of other fruit in that time of the year. The first actual crop ripens in June with the second crop in August. Passover, which is when this story takes place, saw it falls somewhere between March or April, and the fig tree Jesus saw should have had new leaf buds. However, the scripture says that this fig tree Jesus saw was in leaf and should have had at least some early green figs. But when he got close to the tree, he saw that there was no fruit at all. So he cursed the fig tree because it promised the presence of fruit, but instead it was barren. Jesus went to the temple to expect to see spiritual things happening in the temple, but it was barren. It showed no spiritual fruit. Shallow faith. The law, the law of Moses required, and you understand what's happening in there, that on the, in Passover festival, the, the, the Jews were required to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. So they got to the place over the course of the centuries that they, instead of bringing their animals and their sacrifices with them, they could just buy them there. So they would bring their money, and they would buy the lamb, they would buy the doves, they would buy the, the, the flour and the bread that they needed for their sacrifices to, to do their, their religious responsibility. But the law of Moses had required that the Jews bring the lamb chosen for their Passover, into their house for four days before they were to sacrifice it. Does anybody love animals here? Is anybody going to bring an animal in their house, name it, love it, feed it, cuddle it, and then cook it for dinner? <laughs> That's a sacrifice. You see what I'm saying? But when you just go to the grocery store, when I'm a city girl... <laughs> And I go to the grocery store, I go to my Kroger, and my meat comes in neat little packages. That's a different thing entirely. I'm not on the farm sacrificing my animal that I've fallen in love with so that I, I could have dinner. So what happens? I don't take seriously the thing that God has asked me to do because it's no longer a sacrifice. It's no longer hard. It's no longer meaningful. It takes the meaning out of it. Like the fig tree, the religion looked good. It looked like it should have fruit. It looked like it should offer spiritual nourishment to feed the spiritually hungry, but in fact, it offered nothing. It was barren. Two takeaways from this story to talk about shallow faith, and by that I mean unrooted faith. Performing the acts of faith without the presence of God is meaningless. Are we trying to check all the boxes? 
performing Christian activities rather than pressing in and the, to the transformational power of Jesus Christ? Are we, com- are we, we are commanded to be like Jesus, to be transformed into his image, so living as a Christian in this world should be like Jesus lived in this world, incarnationally. Our worship should be incarnational. Our relationships should be incarnational. Our lives should be incarnational. And the other thing, the other takeaway is there is nothing real or authentic under the surface of unfruitful religion. It's just the ritual practice of faith, of religion. It's not faith itself. They didn't need faith. They just needed money to come and do to fulfill the requirements that the temple required of them. The fig tree looked fruit-bearing. It appeared to offer the presence of fruit, but in reality, it was barren. Temple worship was festive and active, but it was barren of what mattered most. Do we act the part? Speak the part? Look the part? We might look healthy, but in truth, we are not producing fruit. And if we get up close to us some, in hopes of finding fruit, you discover it's only a facade. And we are not fulfilling the plans and the purpose God has for us. That is shallow faith. And it's barren. And what causes barren land? Lack of water. And the Bible, it's all about the moisture, right? That's what the the scripture tells us. And our main text says that the seed that fell on rocky ground and dried up because it had no moisture. And in scripture, I won't go into this for the sake of time, um, but in scripture, water is symbolic for the Holy Spirit. Okay, you can, you can look throughout the scriptures, and, and water is symbolic for the Holy Spirit. If the answer to a hard heart is listening, the answer for shallow roots is presence. It's cultivating the presence of God through a relationship with the Holy Spirit. The seed on the rock are those who receive the word joyfully when they hear it, but they have no root They believe for a while but fall away when they are tempted. Religion won't see you through a crisis. Religion won't see you through. It's just activity. Many people hear about Jesus and are attracted to him and his words. Jesus is attractive and people want to hear him. The young man, the rich young ruler, wanted to hear. Everyone was coming. He wanted to hear. He wanted to receive something from Jesus. But his words, but Jesus' words don't sink into lives deep enough to withstand life's problems or life temptations. There is no presence of the Holy Spirit to water the roots. So we need to guard against Christian activity that is primarily performance meaning it's all show above the ground. It's all leafy and green and looks like it's fruit-bearing, but when you get close to it, there's nothing there. Our roots can't be dry. We, we have to be thirsty for Holy Spirit's presence, but we also need to be intentionally to water our spirit, Joel soil. We can't just wait. We can't just come here on Sunday mornings or I can't go to church. We have to be able to, to irrigate our own soil with the word, with worship, with prayer, that's a theme. <laughs> um, we need to cultivate the transformational presence of Jesus. And then Jesus went on to say that the sower then sowed seeds among thorny plants. So we've talked about the hard heart. We've talked about the shallow roots. And now we're going to talk about when, when they sowed the seeds among thorny plants. The scripture says, other seed fell among thorny plants and the thorns grew with the plants and choked them. In other words, the good seed was choked off by what we would consider weeds. So we're going to talk a little bit about the nature of weeds. <laughs> weeds produce abundant seed, have abundant seed production. And we live in a world that sows bad seed in abundance, don't we? Weeds grow everywhere and everywhere, and we can see in our culture that Bad seeds are growing abundantly. Weeds grow quickly. Weeds grow much more quickly, and they steal the resources. They they can steal the moisture. They can steal the nutrients from the soil. 
The seeds of weeds can remain dormant for a long time. You may not realize they're even there until at the right moment in the right situation, then they will grow. And that not that true of our lives, that there might be something in our lives that lays dormant for a long time and then something will trigger it and then we'll end up in a situation that we never dreamed we would be or we'd fall to a temptation that we never thought we would. Weeds are adapted for long-term survival. As time goes on, the root system of weeds grow deeper and stronger. Anybody have a garden they need to weed? <laughs> you don't maintain it. They take over, and then it's harder to get them out because we have some things in our front little uh, area that are just, it's hard. You can't get rid of them. I mean, they just, it's just really very hard, and they're, they choke out all the other plants. Weeds are adapted to spread. Left alone, weeds will choke out the good and not the other way around. That's why you have to weed, right? Weeds have the ability to occupy sites disturbed by human activities. Unwanted roots or weeds will grow where godly growth won't take hold. Okay? Um, and many weeds keep the, the, the taproot and are drought tolerant and are hard to remove. You know, you have to weed, you have to get it, you have to get the whole thing or it's going to grow right back, right? Um, so we got to get, we got to get the weeds out. Um, my point here is, there's a whole other message here that I don't have the time to get into about the weeds and getting roots. Um, but we all deal with weeds that have rooted themselves in our lives. Um, and unless we deal with them, they will push out everything good in our life. And they will take over. They are roots of unresolved emotional and spiritual pain. We have weeds rooted of bitterness. We can have roots of unforgiveness. We can have roots of temptation and sin. And the one we all struggle with, the biggie, the root of pride. Weeding takes diligence. It takes effort. It takes time. Um, all of these things have to be rooted out. Because the only way to get rid of the weed is to pull it permanently, is to pull it out by its root. Weeds. So finally, we get to Jesus talks about the fruitful abundance of the seed sown in good soil. In verse 8, still other seed landed on good soil. When it grew, it produced 100 times more grain than was scattered. And as he said it, he called out, everyone who has ears should pay attention. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because this is, we want to talk about good soil. Do we have any farmers? Any farmers here? Anybody? Ah. Um, you know how important the soil is. Um, and what makes good soil. And I don't, I had to do a little research on this when I was working on this. Um, good soil is loamy. It combines sand and silts and clay, relatively equal parts. Loamy soil is ideal for plants because it holds plenty of moisture, but also drains well so that sufficient air can reach the roots Loamy soil is full of nutrients, and it holds water. Hum humus. Humus? Humus? Humus. The end result of decaying material, including trees, plants, and even animals. Good soil is made of good tilth, and the word tilth comes from the old English word meaning basically to labor or to work. Tilth is what happens when you work the soil. Favorable tilth implies good conditions for seed germination and root proliferation, allowing crops to thrive. You need sufficient depth of good soil to grow good crops. I hope you're hearing with spiritual ears. When I'm proper level of nutrients. You got to feed the soil sometimes. Um, you need large populations of beneficial microorganisms. And basically that's, you need a community. 
Your dirt is a community. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. So, uh, not your dirt, your soil is a community of organisms that all work together to create the perfect environment for fruitful production. And good soil is resistant to weeds and to degradation. I once saw this, um, I've seen it twice now because it was so fascinating to me. It's a little documentary called the, the Biggest Little Farm, and you can watch it on Prime, I think. But it's about this couple who, are in lived in Cal who live in California, and they wanted to have a farm. And so they bought this land, they bought this old farm that was just dust. I mean, it was dirt. There was no good soil. There was, you know, it was all dead, and all the, the orchards were dead, and or at least dormant, and it, was, it looked horrible, and it was dry. Nothing was sustaining life there. The farm had failed. The previous owners had, had failed. But they bought it, and, it, and they started changing the soil. And they, I, I won't go into all of it, but they created a manure tea <laughs> and sprayed all the stuff, and they began to plant, and they began to work the soil, and they began to feed the soil, and they began to irrigate the soil, and they began to tend to the soil and work it. And then they, they, they in, ended up with this ecosystem that produces beautiful fruit, they have animals, they have crops. It is an amazing, it was an amazing transformation. My point here is dirt can be transformed into soil with time and intention and hard work. It, become the, it can become the place where seeds can take root and they can grow and they can bear fruit and beauty. And the question is, how do we make bad dirt? How do we talk, how do we spiritually make bad soil good? Well, according to when I was looking, like, how do you, how do you know, kind of, I went to use the Google. <laughs> and one of the things they said was to get a soil test. Test your soil to see, to check its health. Well, is there anything that's going to check our spiritual health other than trials and temptations? When I said get a soil test, yeah, life's going to test my soil, right? <laughs> Things are going to happen. James 1 reminds us to consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, and lack nothing. Life will test us, and it tests how deep and good and the quality of our soil is receptive to the word of God. So, get a soil test was number one. Another one was remove unwanted thorny plants and weeds. Like I said, there's a whole other thing there that I, I'm not going into today, but basically, when you're pulling your weeds, you're working through the process of confession and repentance. And even if, the, you know, even, you know, you've been a saint for a long time, there's still opportunity to let those, we get some weeds in there, we need to get them out, and we do that through confession and repentance. And then we start adding things in. Get rid of the weeds. We start adding in compost, decomposed organic matter. And that can be the death of other plants and forests. That's, you know, that would be that. Or if you have to add a manure or some sort of natural fertilizer. I just want to say this here. God, when we're talking about waste, right? <laughs> God wastes nothing. Even our mistakes, even those pulled weeds can become compost that will fuel and feed the soil that will bear fruit in your life. God will not waste anything in our lives, the good or the bad, the mistakes, our trials, the, the crisis that aren't, have anything to do with that aren't our fault. The things that come into our life, God will not waste them. They will become a part. If we allow them, we, we will, that can, can become a part of the soil. But as we allow the things of the world to die, again, those things that are of the world, those weeds, those things that we're pulling up can become a part 
of what can grow into something amazing and beautiful. You have to prevent soil compaction. So you can't be like trampling on it. Which means we take care of it and we listen and we're obedient to the Holy Spirit's presence. Or we add cover crops or mulch, which protects from erosion and compacting and prevents weed growth. But what would that be spiritually? Community, right? What's going to help us is our community and accountability and being one with another. And then the final thing here is let, le- let fields lie fallow. What's really important, one thing that I think sometimes in our modern culture we tend to neglect is Sabbath. And there's a whole other, of course, there's a whole other thing about the, the year of Jubilee and what God required of the Jews in, in the Old Testament. We read about, in Lay, you know, there was, it was obedience and they never did it and they made price for it again and there's another story there. But part of it was to leave the ground fallow because it needed it. The land needed the Sabbath. Our hearts, the soil of our hearts needs Sabbath. We need to find that place of rest where we can just rest in Jesus' presence, rest in him. And and so Sabbath is an important part. Um, That's what your pastor is doing right now. She's Sabbathing. She's having a rest. It's a good thing. It's a God thing. You need it too. We all need it. We all need, we're all busy. Life is busy. And we need Sabbath. And ultimately, the seed that fell on good soil are those who hear the word and commit themselves to it with a good and upright heart. And through their resolve, they bear fruit. I don't know if there's a successful farmer, a successful orchard keeper, a successful gardener who grows beautiful gardens, impeccable crops, beautiful fruit, and does nothing to their fields. It just doesn't happen. Grace is free. Discipleship costs. And what Jesus is talking about here is discipleship, is being a disciple of Jesus Christ, being a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes, our salvation into the kingdom, entrance into God's kingdom, our making heaven our home, that is free. But living a life here that is honoring to God and grows and bears fruit for the kingdom costs. It costs resolve. It costs tension. It costs, and it costs our time our obedience, our sacrifice of the things that, of the flesh so that we can bear fruit for God's kingdom. Discipleship is the means to turn the dirty mess of our hearts and souls into rich soil in which the word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit can take root and grow and flourish. It's the cultivation of our hearts, our souls, our spirits, and our mind. Discipleship is what we can do so that God can do what we cannot. You know, the farmer, the, the, the farmer can sow the seed. The orchard keeper can plant the tree. The flower gardener can plant and grow the flowers, water them, weed, tend. But there's only one who can make it grow, and that is Jesus. So we have to do this stuff so that he can do what we cannot do, and that is produce the fruit in our lives. But if we don't do what we're supposed to be, we're going to be like the rich young ruler, and he will let our orchard, he will let our soil go bad. He will let, because that he lets people live with the choices that they make. And so my challenge for you today is to just take a few minutes. We're going to close our eyes. We're just going to take a few seconds, a couple minutes, maybe maybe a minute, maybe not that long. But I want you to think about what's the state of your spiritual soil. Are there hard places? You might not have a hard heart for every single thing, but there might be a little path over here. There might be a hard place over here 
that a relationship or that thing or whatever it might be that you don't want to hear what God's asking. Maybe it's a something financial or maybe it's something in a relationship or maybe it's something, a choice that you're making. Is the word of God hitting that and you're res- resisting it? Or are there places in your soil, in your soul that are dry and shallow because we're not spending time having our devotions or we're not spending time in the presence of the Holy Spirit or we're going through the motions of religiousness are there things, are there weeds taking root that are trying to push out the goodness of God weeds are sneaky Weeds will grow up through cement, cracks, and they'll take over. It's so much easier to maintain than it is to get them out once they've taken over. So maybe this is an opportunity to go weed, go pull a few weeds in your soul. <laughs> maybe there's Somebody that you're kind of angry with, and there's some forgiveness that needs to happen. Maybe there's a temptation that you're battling, and the root just needs to be yanked up through confession and repentance. Maybe there's a hurt that you're nursing. We all get hurt. We all have pain. We all have disappointment. But maybe we we keep it going. And it's depriving you of the richness of God's abundance in your life. I'm not necessarily going to ask anybody to come down to the front and pray. If I'm here. If anybody wants any prayer, I will be up here, and I'm happy to pray with anybody. Um, and so I'm going to pray and bless and close, um, but I'll be around if anybody wants any prayer. Again, it's been a joy to be here with you today. Um, Father, I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, that You come to us like you come to the young, rich young ruler, and you you love us, but you require, you hold us accountable for the very thing we don't want to surrender. And Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would cross this room, cross every heart in this room, those watching um, online, Lord, that you would speak to that very thing. But more importantly, Lord, we know you will speak. Let us have ears to hear. Let us listen. Let us know that you love us and it would be it's for our best. It's for our it's for abundant life. It's for freedom and joy and peace and all of the things. Lord, Apply the Holy Spirit to the hard places of our lives so that your good word, your presence, isn't snatched from us and devoured by the enemy. Lord, I pray that the soil, that the root, we would have good enough soil of hearts that the word would take root in this community and bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Thank you, Father. Lord, I speak blessing and abundance. I pray that you would bless these wonderful people. I pray that you would love them, that you would meet their needs, Lord, and pray for their coming and their going. Lord, I pray that this word that you spoke to your disciples, to these people who gathered and to your disciples would take root in their lives, in all of our lives. 
and produce fruit for the kingdom of God. This morning, we give you praise, we give you glory, and we honor you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I guess you're dismissed. I wasn't sure who was going to close me or Bill, um, but I am. So um, we need to take up offerings still. So um, Bill, if you would want to grab a bag and do that, I'll pray over the offering real quick and then we'll be dismissed. God, I just thank you for this whole entire service. God, I just pray you'd help us to take it with us as we go this week. Help us to apply it to our lives. God, I pray that you'd take this offering and that you would bless it and use it for your glory. Amen. Everyone have a great week. I think Debbie is not here next week still, but then after that, she'll be back. So have fun this week. <laughs>